Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Audiophile Roundtable. I'm Steve Westman. You see Michael Fremmer from trackingangle.com. Michael, how are you? I'm doing good. Very, very good. Everything's good in my life. Well, that's good to, good to hear. It's been a while since you've been on the roundtable. Um, I'm excited to have you back on. I think there's a lot we need to discuss, uh, yes. sort of put out there. Um, I told you before we went on, I'm Canadian, so we're not into fighting here. We're just into sort of smoothing things over. But I, I think before we get into some of the, the meat and the potatoes, uh, I first wanted to talk about the latest release. And this has just came out today. Um, and I'm sure you've heard about it, but I'm I'm really curious to hear your take on it. So I'm sure you've, you've gotten the original over the years, but this one here, if you can see, this is the Isaac Hayes, a hot buttered soul craft recordings. Um, it's going to be the Neotech One Step um, mastered by Bernie Grunman. And what's cool about it, that song, Walk On By, which is um, obviously a big track, one of the most popular tracks that Isaac Hayes had, um, written by Burke Bacharach. Obviously, Hal David was a lyricist, uh, did the lyrics on it, um, made famous by Dionne Warwick. Yes. But here's the cool, but here's the cool thing. It's been sampled by guys like um, Biggie Smalls, uh, oh, yeah. Snoop Dogg, and recently, Doja Cat, Paint the Town Red. She did, the, she did a little... Uh, walk on by sort of sample from that song as well. So have you, you obviously have the original, you have copies yes. of this. What is your take on this album even before the, uh, the, the new, the new craft comes it's, up? It's, it's just an inter interesting choice to make. I'm not sure. We'll see. We'll see what they do with it. And the original sounds very good and we'll see what they do with it. I don't, I don't really have much, much else to say about it. It's not like one of my mainstay records that I play all the time. I got it when it first came out and uh played it a bunch but it's not like to me it's not like i mean i'm more into dion warwick's version of it on on her make way for dion warwick which is an amazing recording and and an amazing performance but look we'll see what they, i like the fact that they're doing off-center stuff i don't mean off-center pressings i mean not what you'd expect because there's too much of what you expect coming out again although it's funny when people say don't we have that already don't we have 10 versions of that well maybe you do but there are people getting into this for the first it's like you have to do kind of blue again we already have that we who's we you know, it's... well that goes back and we've had on my on my past shows i mean for instance we we know that uh, rhino hi-fi is coming up with the american beauty um you know cut by kevin gray i think it's in yeah. march and then just like well don't, doesn't everyone have that i mean not everyone has a good copy of american beauty no not right. everyone does. So you know, why not do it again? Yeah, the original was great. The original Warner Brothers pressing was very good. And the one that MoFi did back when Stan Ricker was doing it and they were pressing it in Japan, that one's fantastic. I like that one better than the more recent one that MoFi did. Um, and I haven't heard the one, I think, uh, did Chris Bellman cut one a few years ago? He did the 50th anniversary. Yeah. I didn't get it. Why didn't I get it? Because I've already got a bunch of good ones, you know. I enjoy, I have my Chris Bellman 50th. I have the Mo, the recent 45 RPM MoFi, which are both yeah. analog. And I, I do like the sound of both of them as well. Now I did, now wh who who produced that album or who engineered that album back back in 19? What was you know what? I, I don't, don't remember. remember. I don't know whether it was Lee Hirsch. We could look it up in two seconds. I don't know if it was Lee Hirschberg. I'm not sure it was done by Warner Brothers. I think it was done by, with, with the, at that point, the Grateful Dead was already, you know, pretty much doing their own things. They, they were way into the tech. So I don't know. So I think we should I'm get into it. I, I think we should get into it. Do you want to? Into what? Well, this is the thing. This has been all over, all over the vinyl community. Have you heard of this album before? I opened for them doing stand-up comedy. I, you know that, <laughs> right? I did. No, I, I know that when you did your video on it. Now, I've been, yeah. I mean, I don't know if it's been controversy. You did a video... Um, you know, if anyone doesn't have it already, this is Marky Moon, um, Rhino Hi-Fi Edition. Now, I think it sounds great. I really do. It, I said I it really, really do. Great. It does sound great. So, you know, there are two kinds of records that sound great and better than original pressings. So there are records like the Blue Notes, which were not supposed to sound like what they originally sounded like. That was not the sound that Rudy Van Gelder wanted, the original pressings. I know a lot of people like that sound. And look, it's whatever you like. Go to a hi-fi show. Every room sounds different. And some of the rooms sound absolutely horrendous to me. And some of the rooms sound fantastic. And it all depends on what you like. Um, the original Blue Notes were dynamically compressed and rolled off in the bass. 
and boosted in the in the lower mid bass because uh, Rudy knew that the people buying those records did not have good turntables in those days, and the, the stylus would jump out of the groove if he put all the bass on the record. So he compressed them, and he also cut the bass off. So we know that's not the Rudy Van Gelder sound. That's what he had to do. That's why he hated records. He was not a fan of records at all. Um, if you like that sound, fine. And the vinyl was noisy. I don't get that. The Tone Poet records, that's what's on the tape, and that is what Rudy wanted to have come out because he recorded them that way so that's one thing uh records like the beatles uh albums are bass shy not because that's what the beatles wanted or george martin wanted the bass was rolled off also because the full bass on the record would jump out of the groove on the cheap turntables that kids back then had you know back in the 60s there were only like two or three turntables available to young people so the emi engineers had all the available turntables and they would do a cut and they would plate it and press it. And if it jumped out of the groove, they called it a, you know, a grasshopper cut or some kind of hopper cut. And they would cut it again until they got it to track on those uh, cheap turntables. And so by the time they got it to track on those cheap turntables, the base was rolled off. So if you buy, if you have the mono Beatles box, that's got all the base on the tape. I was there to hear those things being cut. That was an exciting that was that was really one of the greatest right things. Right there, there it is. Yeah. Yeah. And and uh, and so the bass that's on those records is what's on the tape. It's not like, oh well, Paul McCartney is one of the only living Beatles, so he put the bass in there to make because he's a bass player. <laughs> that's not what happened. So Marquee Moon. Okay, so, let's talk about that. Yeah. So looking at looking at Marquee Moon, co-produced by Tom Verlaine. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I've heard people say, well, why don't you ask uh, Lloyd, you know, Richard Lloyd, he, he's still alive. Well, he wasn't the co-producer on the record. The co-producer was uh, Tom Verlaine. So that record was recorded at A&R Studios. A&R Studios is where um, Phil Ramone owned A&R Studios, and that's where uh, Get Skilled Bearder was recorded, and a hundred other audiophile classics. That's where uh, Dionne Warwick's Make Way for Dionne Warwick was recorded. It's a phenomenal recording if you have uh, the right pressing of it. If you have the wrong pressing, it's not that good. So um, we know the studio was an absolutely phenomenal studio. And then it was recorded by Andy Johns, a great engineer who passed away too, too young. He was Glenn Johns' younger brother. He recorded it and he mixed it. And so uh, I'm getting, you hear these beeps going on? I, I just, just deal with it. It happens all day. Uh, so we know it was recorded by a really good rock engineer. It was recorded at a great studio and it was mastered at Sterling Sound. At mm -hmm. that point, uh, one of the two best mastering houses in the country, the best ones were uh, Doug Sachs's place and that. There wasn't other good places as well, but two great places. So we know that money was put into the production and the best people worked on it. So it's credited to Greg Calby and uh, Lee Hulko. Lee Hulko, LH on the Sterling Master, he started that studio and he was credited with really starting great mastering and turning mastering into an art as opposed to just sort of a technical thing. So I called Greg Calby, who's I've been a friend with Greg for since the eighties when he, he, Greg brought over when the CD first came out and Greg had mastered the entire uh, Peter Gabriel catalog for CD. And he was very proud of it. And he said, let me bring over these CDs and play them for you. I said, by all means do. So he brought them over and he started playing them for me and, they were pretty horrible so i said let me play you an original british charisma pressing and i put it on and his face went like this he went what happened i said i don't know what happened but you you hear it it's it's not very good so th that's so i called greg and i said uh you're credited with lee hulko of mastering that record and he said well i don't remember doing that i think by then lee wasn't doing it anymore i think ted jensen actually cut that so I have a call into Ted. I want to get his, if see if he remembers. You know, these guys are cutting all day. They're cutting hundreds of records. They don't exactly. remember everything, you know? No. Well, here's the thing. So one one thing, I mean, about this record, I mean, what you mentioned, I mean, you know, based on the original, it, you know, it didn't have the original intent to it with this, with the latest Rhino Hi-Fi um, cut here. Now, I listened to it again, compared it to my 77 that I have. Not yeah. every single track um, is 
you know, not every single track has more bass or less mids or adjusted. Like right. for instance, uh, in, on Guiding Light, from my comparison to the, this one to the original, it's pretty much it's pretty much verbatim and the same. So it's not like I don't think Kevin Gray um, adjusted every single song or track the same. I think it just depended on what he heard from that master tape. So I mean, very great detail. Um, I mean, this is the thing. No, not a lot of people heard about television before all these videos came out about television. So this is the most <laughs> television. Kevin. Is, including this Kevin. Is, this, is, including this Kevin. is the most. Well, but he did. It, I think even if Kev, you know, Kevin did mention he didn't have the original, the original to compare it to. But I don't know if he, he would have done much different if he did. I don't know. I mean, I think he did a great I don't job. Know. Here. As a lot of detail. And I mean, I was, you know, Richard Lloyd did a, his biography or his autobiography, and he even said he didn't even like the sound of this recording either back in the day. Yeah, so. but he wasn't in charge of it. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. so, so there's two ways of looking at it. You know, so I'm just saying, I said that Kevin sounds great. Is that what yeah. was originally intended? I, I'm not sure. I, I think the guitars, I like the guitars better on the original because, because, uh, you know, his guitars, Tom Verlaine's guitars were bright and uh, ethereal. And they get kind of muted a little bit on, on the reissue. So that's that's my take on it. Okay. And if you if you go to my website, there's a new uh, review, a new comparison by the kid that writes for me, Malachi. He did a very, very good job of comparing the original Chris Bellman's cut and, uh, and, and the new Kevin cut. And he went into a pretty much good detail about explaining what you know, what is intended. What, what are we supposed to be doing when we do reissues? I thought it was very well, well done. And it's whatever you like. This shouldn't turn into a into a big controversy, you know. I no. I just I like the original better. It's not, it's not a hi fi ish record. I think, given how it was done, and the money that was put into it, and where it was done, I think the original is the document. And I, like I like the original Beatle records better than than uh, Charles well, Martin's I issues. Mean, tele I know tele television was a club band for how many years in New York, right? So, I mean, they basically had all these tracks, went into the studio and, and, and laid, laid down the tracks, and that was that. I don't think they really focused too much on the engineering side and worried about the sound when that was recorded. For Marky Moon? Yes. I disagree with that completely. Why would they go to the time and trouble and expense of recording an A&R? They could have done it in a lot yeah. of less expensive studios. And they brought in Andy Johns, who was a British guy. They brought him in for a reason and tom verlaine was the co-producer and the label mm -hmm. was spending money on a relatively unknown band and that record never sold anyway no. so i think when you have a great engineer and a great venue and uh the best mastering house doing it um if the, if sterling sound you know sterling sound is where all the great island pink label well most of the great pink label island records were were uh, mastered you look on uh the original um T for the Tillerman. Yep. Uh, it was mastered there. Lee, Lee Hulko mastered most of those great pink labels, except for the ones that were done in Britain. But at any rate, the sound that came out of that studio was much better than what's on that record. So when I hear a record like that, uh, I have to think that's what they wanted because it's certainly not what the studio would do, not what... Um, Andy Johns would do and not what Sterling Sound would do if they were trying to give you what was on the tape, which is what Kevin gave you. Th that's that's my take of it. It was what and I was. yeah. And I like Kevin's cut. And I think, you know, I think the thing is for 40 bucks to get it's a great. really high high it's quality, great. you know, pressed it optimal, you know, you know mastered yes. and cut from the analog tape by yeah. one of the greatest uh greatest engineers i mean yeah absolutely i mean this is yeah. getting a lot this is getting a lot of publicity and it's selling a lot i mean i know i yeah. know rhino is very happy with sales right now it's done very 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 good so um if no one does it does if you want something new not in your collection television grab it great great album i love the song marky moon 10 minutes and what 41 seconds pure joy yes but here but here but here, <laughs> and i'm not joy. and i never was disagreeing with anybody who like i said it sounds great it sounds better than the better than the original just like the blue notes sound better than the original but there i i know i'm sure that, that they're supposed to sound better but i love i love the blue notes they sound great but here's the one that doesn't get a lot of i mean we had marky moon come out and then we had right. coleman's uh you know change of the century this isn't getting much uh credit this sounds absolutely incredible michael i reviewed that I, it. I mean, the detail on this, I mean, Kevin knows his jazz, as we both know. He knows his album and this thing. Do you know why I, that sounds great? 
I think this is the best sounding uh, change of the century out there. Why does it sound so great? It is because Bones Howe engineered. Bones Howe was one of the greatest recording engineers uh, of all time. You know, Bones did all the great Tom Waits Asylum records. That's right. Small change. I mean, that's unbelievable. That guy did great stuff, much better than the Tom Dowd stuff that came later. So, yeah. And Kevin nailed it. He nailed that one. I mean, that one, I mean, I guess people think I have something against Kevin Gray. You know, I worked with Kevin Gray on the MCA heavy vinyl series in the nineties that he cut that I was involved with, with MCA records. We did who's next. We did a whole bunch of great records and Kevin cut those. (laughs) So, you know, Kevin cut my, Kevin cut the, the Tron soundtrack that I was involved with that I supervised the soundtrack to. So, you know, well, anyways, I've been, I've been, I know there's been so much talk about this marquee moon. And I mean, probably 50% of the people hadn't heard of television before this yeah. all came out. So this is a good opportunity. You know, you're getting for 49 bucks, Rhino Hi-Fi. There's still some out there to buy. Why not buy yeah. it? I think you'll be ple- present, you know, really pleasantly surprised. And the thing is, this is a guitar band. So guitar will be the focus. Just like we learned from Chris Bellman last week that Van Halen wanted the guitar to be the focus on his at records, not the bass, not the drums, just the guitar. Well, that's the reason why I think the original pressing is is more what Tom Verlaine wanted. <laughs> just what you just said. Okay. okay. Yeah. Well, that's true. I mean, for, I mean, if anyone doesn't realize, I mean, Verlaine and Lloyd had two different sort of guitar styles, but they really blended well together. And yep. you really hear the differences on Marquee Moon if you yep. if you really want to compare. And that's, I mean, that's the obviously the the title track, and that is by far, I think, incredible sounding um, track. Um, that one, I think, the mids are a little bit adjusted on on Kevin's version. You might hear a little bit more bass, but all in. I mean, again, not every single track, you know sounds some sound a little bit different some might sound a little bit more like my original so again for 50 bucks buying the original is expensive why wouldn't you buy yeah. this copy that's all i said did we did, did we deal with it finally is this is can we put this to bed yeah i think that the track marky moon sounds way better on the original <laughs> just, yeah. you're a guitar i mean again so again it's it's but this is the thing you just said at the beginning everything's subjective so it could depend yes. on the room it could depend yeah. on your mood mrs fremer might have been pissed off at you so you, you go in listening to marky moon not in when the mrs same fremer is pissed off she comes downstairs when i play it when it's on really loud and she goes i can't hear myself think turn that down that's what mrs fremer does so it could be your mood. It could be your 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 listening room. It could be you had well, a drink before you listened. I mean, who knows? I mean, it's so hopefully subjective. Not, hopefully not, my friend, because before I write anything, I listen many, many times. To- I have to, I can't, I have to, it's not a matter of opinion. In other words, yeah. I have to say, my favorite uh, reader responses is, we have totally different taste, and I like things way different than you like. But I know when I read what you say, that's what it sounds like. That's a big difference than what you like. So uh, I can't let my my mood get in the way of what so I many, write. I don't like to be wrong as far as the perception of what I write. So how many times would you listen to a record before you actually then um, put it down on paper for the review? I don't have to listen more than a couple of times, really, if I'm concentrating on it especially if I'm comparing to original pressing and hearing the reissue, I know it pretty quickly. I mean, that's one thing about doing this a really long time and getting old and people say, well, you're old, you can't hear anymore. Well, that's not true. Uh, uh, like Bernie. I don't think Bernie's going to say his hearing is what it was 40 years ago, but hearing and listening are two different things. And there's uh, a guy that I don't particularly like in this business, but we're not, not even involved in this. When I wrote once that hearing and listening are two different things, he, he mocked that and said that was the stupidest thing he ever heard of. Well, Hearing is what your ears do, and listening is what your brains do. And uh, hearing and listening are two slightly different things, and um, it's a combination of both. My listening is way better than it ever was. So when I was like 20 or 30 and I got involved in this business and I started to, to write reviews, I didn't know what I was doing. I was confused. I, it, it was a mess. Now I really know what I'm doing. And it doesn't take me long to hear something and break it down to what it is and write about it. So you think it's taken probably a good 20 plus years just to get to the level you're at at 40 years? I mean, sort of halfway through your career, you're like, okay, I, I got this now. Or you still go into it sort of second guessing yourself? Speak louder. I can't hear you. No, it's, <laughs> you don't sort of. Pardon? Pardon? I can't hear you don't get off my lawn. That's another funny. It is so funny. There's a guy that, that read this thing. Michael Fremer is angry and I get off my lawn. Because I, at one point I said, when I reviewed the Isonic 
uh, cavitation cleaning machine. Mm. I just happen to say, look, before you start taking people's advice online, find out what they were doing five years ago. You know, know who they are. What were they doing five years ago? And this guy said, so you're saying there's no room for anybody else? He started screaming and yelling at me. There's no room for anybody else. And I said, no, I'm just saying find out what they were doing. You know, were they plucking chickens five years ago? And they saw the vinyl thing is a good thing and they got into it. Just find out. That's all. So we still got things to talk about. I mean, I, the title of the show was, well, lots to talk about, but we're going to talk, um, you know, pros and cons of the Riga sort of product designs. I want to get into more of the mastering engineers today. As you know, I've had a lot of the mastering engineers on the round table yep. over the past few weeks and months. So I want to get into that. Um, let's get into the, I know you had contacted me last week. We had a show and we were talking about sibilance last week and yep. you wanted to sort of tell, talk about that. Yeah, so, you know, sibilance on records is, on we love vinyl, but vinyl has a big problem with sibilance. That's one of the big issues of vinyl playback. And I wanted to talk a little bit about why all that happens and why um, records have sibilance, microphones have sibilance, and turntable setups produce sibilance. And it's really important to understand all of that. So there are certain microphones that it's on the tape. And there's very little you can do about it if it's on the tape, unless you want to play with the tape and change it, which I don't think you want to do. Uh, then there's sibilance caused um, by just the whole process of cutting records. It can add sibilance. And some sibilance is impossible to uh, correct unless you take corrective action. Uh, there are, there are de-essers on the market. Some records... Some mastering engineers back in the day before there was any kind of digital, they would uh, find where the sibilants were. They would record record that particular piece of the, of the track and DS it on another track, another tape, and then cut it into the master. Sibilant after sibilant after sibilant, believe it or not. You can also uh, add a DSer globally to the entire track when you when you're cutting it and but that's got problems that that creates problems that i think is deleterious to the whole sound of the recording and then there are other people who say just leave it it is what it is you know and then there are turntables and tone arms that can add it or cartridges that can add it uh and setups that can add it for a variety of reasons and so i know i get complaints from readers saying well i bought that record and it's it's sibilant right where in that particular place. So I'll go play it and I don't hear the sibilance and I'll record it and send them a file. And they go, you're right. It, you don't have it. What is it? What's the cause? So Mike, I think it could be mic choice. It could be placement of the mic um, in the recording process as well with that. I think that's where this could all start. And is probably one of the most important processes and, you know, not getting the sibilance in your recording. Would that be a big starting point? You know, uh, engineers use certain microphones because they like the microphones. And the microphone may be fantastic, except it has a sibilant problem. That's part of it. So if it's in the recording, you just have to, it is what it is, and you should leave it. But if it's being caused in the in the playback part of it, uh, and not every playback produces it, you have to get to what causes it. And so yeah. that's our, that's my next question. So yeah. then we, we've established the mics, we've established the placement. Now, what's causing it? If you're now listening so, to the... Well, it's a, tra it's a tracking issue. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this is... Let me put your full screen. Hold on, Michael. Okay, have you ever seen this? Okay, you ever see this picture before? So, yeah, this is the Westrex cutting. This is the 4545 stereo cutting system. So here... I hate doing this backwards. So right here, that is this. And I got to look at it because that's fine. Okay. This is the right channel being modulated and you see the direction that it's moving. So when the right channel is being modulated, the stylus moves that way. When the left channel is being modulated, the stylus moves that way. When there's an in phase modulation, the stylus moves laterally, which is that way, which is a mono cut. That's what mono is. And when it's out of phase, it moves vertically, like right here, up and down. 
those are the four basic ways that it moves. And with that, because of uh, outer phase, six, it just, I don't want to get into too much detail, no. but those four movements are what produces stereo and mono in records. And so it's very precise. It's very difficult to get it exactly right. And if you don't get it exactly right, you're going you're gonna to have issues. And not everybody wants to try to get it exactly right. And that's just the way it is. And so, but if you're going to speak about this subject in public and, and tell people how things sound, I think you owe it to the people you're talking to to understand this and to try to get your turntable to be set up as properly as possible, you know? But not everybody does that. So this is what causes the problem. If, if the cartridge is not sitting in the groove correctly, it creates problems. It creates uh, separation problems. It creates distortion problems. And it creates issues because the stylus is not following the way the groove is cut by the cutting uh, stylus. Well, and, that's one the thing. Thing, and that's one thing as well. I'm just thinking too, like no stylus is as sharp as say the cutting stylus, right? So uh, otherwise it would uh, you know, recut the groove of the record. So, I mean, that's another thing too you got to well, the, look at. The ones that come closest do the best job of getting all the information out. So if you use a, a round stylus to play back, well, you can't get into trouble with that because no matter what you do with a round stylus, it's going to see the groove the same way in every in every direction. So it's not going to make any errors that are going to create uh, sibilant problems or any other kind of problems. The problem is it will not get out of the groove what's in the groove. You you lose a lot of information. So that's the trade off. People love those um, Denon 103R with a round stylus, and you know it's it's so beautiful sounding. Yeah, but you're missing so much information. If you want to get what's out of the groove, the, the closest cutting stylus to the closest playback stylus to the cutting stylus is the replicant from Ortofon. That comes the closest. And I, I've got a picture of one here, I think. I'm, I may not have. No, I don't have it here. I have it. I don't have it. Uh, okay. But it's the closest. It, but if you don't set it up correctly, it's horrible sounding. So when Ortofon came out with their A90, which is, which is a very radical cartridge, and they put the replicant on it, and the reviews came out that it's a bright, hard, and sibilant sounding cartridge. All of the reviewers that were uh, saying that about the cartridge were actually reviewing their bad setup as opposed to what the cartridge sounds like. So it's I a saw this here. Sword. I saw this here. So John Loper is saying conical. So now here's the thing. You no know, line contact, right, is better with an elliptical, and elliptical is better than a conical. Wouldn't that... Wouldn't yes. you agree with that? Okay. Yes. And if I if I left the premises, I should have brought this. Um, I could show you all of those stylus shapes in a picture. Would you like me to look for that? How long <laughs> is it? Do, well, no, it's fine. I don't want to sit here and have to have to sing to everyone. That would be embarrassing. So the line but... contact at, at the edges is a sharp line. Right. And so it's going to get, for the horizontal modulations, it's going to get all of that out of the groove. For the vertical ones... If the stylus rake angle isn't correct, that line is going to bounce around in the groove and cause intermodulation distortion. So you want to get that right. correct. Right. So, you know, I brought some. Let's see that. So here's. So I use a microscope to do the setup. This is a line contact stylus. And that line, a vertical line, is the stylus rake angle of this cartridge in the groove. When you set this cartridge up with the arm parallel to the record surface which is how all of the tone arms that can be adjusted will tell you to do you're at 87.1 degree that's not right you want to be at about 92 to 93 degrees because that's where the cutting stylus is is, is cutting the vertical modulation and when that is off by a lot you're going to get sibilance distortion you know not necessarily major but enough that you'll hear it so uh that's a problem. So I wanted to show you that. Um, again, I don't want to get too far into, into the weeds here. Well, no, one other thing. I think Nathan Goss was asking, Michael, can you talk about weight and what you use to determine the right balance? In other words, tracking force. Yeah. So first of all, you should stay within the tracking force recommended uh, by the manufacturer or close to it. 
because uh, you know some people like to try to track really light because they feel that they're going to do less damage to their records if you track too light. I did the most damage to my records when I tracked too light. When I had a sure, I had a sure V15 in the early days of the V15 when you could track from three quarters to a gram and a half. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, if I track at three quarters, I'll do the least damage. But actually, I was tracking too light for the arm that I had, and so the stylus was actually bouncing around the groove and and doing damage. So try to stay within the mid range of what the manufacturer rep, you know recommends. Um, yes, the, exactly. too light is doing more damage. There's a new record test record that's going to come out that um, Garth Powell produced. So and Kevin Gray cut. So Garth does the uh, cables and the electrical uh, enhancements for audio quest. They're very, very good. He's also a musician. And uh, one of the records that I put on this uh, last YouTube video that I posted is he, he's the percussionist on it. It's a phenomenal sounding record that Joe Harley produced. You should listen to that track. It's amazing. Yeah. And there are no sibilance on it. <laughs> Just no, no <laughs> on it. Um, And this test record has only one thing on it, which is a, it's a pop. It's it's a DC pop. It goes tick, <clears throat> tick, tick. That's all that's on it. <clears throat> and you can use it not to set up your turntable, but to, to evaluate how well you've set it up. So you play the, the record and and check your tracking for us. Listen to the tick. You can use an SPL meter close to your loudspeaker and listen to both how loud the tick is and how clean the tick is. And you can adjust your tracking for us till the tick is as minimal as possible and as clean as possible and then you're really at the right place according to what he think what he says it's a very interesting test and you can also set your azimuth with that and you can set you can set everything with that for the final little bitty adjustment so i'm happy to say when he brought it down here and said let's do the azimuth first and you could hardly hear anything any tick at all which means it was set i set mm -hmm. it up correctly i don't like to be embarrassed when people come down to my room <laughs> How long does it take you to set your your uh, table up properly? Like, is it is it a long process? Uh, it takes a, about two hours to really dial it in correctly, and even then, we don't know if it's set up correctly because what uh, you know, Jr. Boyclair is the guy that I depend upon for most of the research that's on this, and his his mentor was Wally Malowich, who taught me everything that I know about this subject. Mm -hmm. And Wally passed away, and that was sad. Um, and so what JR got a really expensive microscope, and, and the dirty secret that he discovered is that when the stylus is inserted into the cantilever, so the first dirty secret he discovered was obviously this one, that setting the record, setting the, the, the um, arm parallel to the record surface does not necessarily produce great results. What's it say there? What degree is that? I can't, 87.1? 87 87.1. Okay. And, and there are people who say, well, you started out uh, with the record parallel to the record surface. You don't need a microscope. Set it parallel, and then you play with it till you get it where you like it. You would never get that to be right. You'd have to turn it up to like a ski slope to get to 92 degrees. That's a cartridge that should go back to the manufacturer and get replaced. Or you insert a shim at the head shell leave the arm parallel and insert a shim to correct for the problem. And so what I'm saying is if you have a hundred dollar cartridge, you're not going to do that. If you have a $500 cartridge, you're not going to do it. If you've spent thousands of dollars, this cartridge, by the way, this one was an $8,000 cartridge. Which one, which one was that? I'm not going to say the brand of it because I don't want to, <laughs> I'm not going to say. Okay. This is a, uh, Agora, cantilever stylus assembly that's used by a lot of manufacturers and they're trying to get it better because now that we've discovered this but uh you can get shims like these and i know some people are saying i don't i just want to play records i don't want to Listen. i don't want this kind of thing okay you can just play records if you care about this and you've spent a lot of money on a cartridge i think you want to know whether you bought a defective cartridge or a good cartridge so, and I'm not trying to uh, hawk J.R. Boyclair's uh, service, but I'm going to tell you about it. You, you can send a cartridge to him and he'll charge you three to four hundred dollars, which is more than some people spend on a stylus uh, on, a, on a cartridge. And he'll give you a report and tell you, um, here's what's wrong with your cartridge. So if you buy a Riga turntable and you buy 
uh, one of Riga's more expensive cartridges and you send it to him. And when you get it back, you can get sent back these shims that will correct all the problems that you might have in your cartridge. So um, it's worth doing if you've got an expensive cartridge. If you've spent $8,000 on a cartridge, it's yeah. worth spending the extra money. To and, I wanna get, and, and I want to get into something as well. I know we talk a lot about expensive gear. I mean, I'm blessed to have a full Riga set up and I'm getting a yep. pure Fidelity Harmony um, as a promo as well. So again, we talked before, I mean, some of the more budget oriented turntables and I know um, you recommended a couple because not, every, not everyone has $10,000 systems or 30,000 or 50, no, of course. Or, of right? Course. So, so someone getting into this who wants to really experience, you know, good quality, high vinyl, you know, high, high quality vinyl such yeah. as UHQRs or MoFi one steps or the blue notes. Uh, what are you recommending for a good budget oriented turntable? Well, I had a guy while I was online being told, I only, recommend expensive gear and don't bother asking me my advice <laughs> i i recommended to a guy a u-turn turntable the u-turn turntables are really oh well, that was quick and we didn't plan this so i don't know how you do that you're, are you a mind reader so the u-turns uh now they invested in a magnesium molded magnesium tone arm and you can get that molded magnesium tone arm in their 250 fifty dollar turntable which is amazing and there's so, and there's and there's two of them. There's the Orbit Basic for like two ninety nine, and the Orbit yeah. Plus for like five hundred. Sorry. Right. And I reviewed one of those, and it sounded really, really good, because magnesium is a self damping material. So that arm is not going to be resonating. It's it's self damping. So and that's a very good turntable for the money. Those guys, I met those guys and interviewed them when they first got started. They they graduated Tufts University, and after their parents put them through college and they, and they spent a lot of money putting them through college and their parents said, what are you going to do now? And they both, they all said, we're going to start a, a company making turntables. <laughs> and their parents were like, ah. <laughs> they've sold a lot of turntables and they're made in America, which I like. And they're very good turntables for the money, especially. And they're not made out of plastic and they will not vibrate like a drum. They're good. For the price, you can't go wrong. And they're at, are they out of Massachusetts? Where are they from? What's, yeah, they're out of Woburn. Yeah. Woburn, Mass. Have you been so to the, the shop? Uh, no, I haven't been there. I probably should go there. And Woburn is where uh, the guy that used to own a one-stop that I did all the radio commercials for in the 70s used to have his one-stop. So I, I was in Woburn many times. So uh, I have a certain affinity for Woburn. Um, so those are very good. Uh, the inexpensive Rigas are good. The projects are good. As long as they're not made out of plastic, plastic will bang like a drum. Mm -hmm. Not a good idea. Yeah. Well, I'm excited too, being from Canada. Um, you know, this is the one, I don't know if you ever reviewed it, the Harmony, the Harmony, pre, Pure Fidelity Harmony uh, turntable uh, with the Stratos MC cart, the live. Uh, um, Origin, Origin Live makes some really yeah. interesting products. I've reviewed a bunch of their turntables and I, and I should get that one to review also. I try to stay away from Canadian products because they're not very good. Oh, did I say Come that? on, purefidelity.ca. It's Canadian. Canadian. I mean, from, from Vancouver, like right here, like just next, just down the street from me. It's amazing. You're lucky to live around there. It's beautiful. I know. So, so um, yeah, so there's lots of good turntables. So let's talk about Riga for a second because Riga has some really interesting ideas about tone arms. And uh, Roy Gandy is a very smart man, and I've stayed at his house, and I – know all the people involved with the company and i just lost what i wanted to show you i wanted to say uh, just go go to the screen michael i found this fascinating i mean you know p78 riga's come it came out with a p78 to play your set your old 78s from grandma frimmer right and Amazing. they also they also have a uh a 78 RPM pulley that you can just pop onto <laughs> the on, on some of the older ones and play 78s but of course you don't want to play it using your 30 so it's kind of not practical. So what stylus would someone use for a 78? That's a great question. Like, what it's would a, you it's use? It's a 0.7 or 1 mil, depending upon uh, what the era of the cartridge is. So if you have a cartridge where you can pop out the stylus and replace it, then it's fine. Yeah. If you have a moving coil where you can't, no. But I wanted to show you the uh, the, the Riga book, which I had here. Oh. And I now I can't find it. But it, it Riga says their turntables that a turntable is essentially a vibration measuring device and that's what it is and so the goal is to have all the vibrations that it's measuring come out of the stylus groove interface and no place else 
and for nothing else to vibrate. Otherwise, you, cre you create havoc. So Riga believes in rigidity, 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 rigidity. So that's why their arms are fixed. You, you can't mm. adjust uh, VTA, SRA. You can't adjust azimuth. You can't adjust anything except overhang. I've so, got the P6. I, I absolutely know what you're talking about. P6 is a great turntable. It's a great turntable. Yeah, and and uh, there's a lot of great things about it. And and their basic, you know, what Roy Gandy says is that they want very low mass. The lower the mass of the turntable, the better, because the vibrations don't hang. Whatever vibrations are not supposed to be there, they don't hang around and resonate around. They they die off because the thing is so light. That's their take. It's also possible to get that same. Uh, result with a very high mass turntable properly designed the energy just gets sunk into it so it, whichever way you want to go is fine as long as you do it the right way now to buy an inexpensive turntable with an arm that adjusts everything where the arm is flopping around all over the place it's not worth it's not worth it i don't think so i understand what riga is saying so if you buy a riga if you buy an expensive riga like a p10 which is a costly turn turntable i set up uh ben gibbard's turntable you know ben gibbard is the lead singer and the main guy in death cab for cutie great guy fanatical record guy he he called me once he he was traveling doing the touring the country with death cab for cutie came home to seattle to do a show and then stayed at home and he, he was cleaning records and had a question <laughs> and he called me i just you know i just love that the yeah, guy yeah. is you know he's a great artist and and he comes home you know to sleep at home and he has to clean records he's a fanatic anyway what was i getting to um so, so riga, riga the tracking arm yeah, yeah i know yeah. so they believe in the most rigid arm is the best arm but you have no ability to adjust anything except tracking force and anti-skating so what do you do if you want to put a really good cartridge on there um you really ought to spend a couple of extra bucks and send it off to JR. I know this is sounding like I'm shilling for him, but I'm not because nobody else is doing what he's doing. You send it off to JR. He looks at it under a microscope. He sees what the azimuth problems. He measures the azimuth and the odds of the azimuth being correct when the arm is parallel to the, re when the head shell is parallel to the record surface is almost never, almost never. Even though you've got it physically parallel to the record surface, the odds are the stylus has been inserted into the cantilever off by a certain amount, or the motor has been inserted into the uh, body of the cartridge off by a certain amount. And when it's off, you're not getting the separation, the full separation that you can get. Because don't forget, one, one channel is that, one channel is that. If the stylus is not sitting in the groove exactly correct, you're going to get less than a uh, perfect separation left l minus r or r minus l so your sound stage is not going to be as wide and expansive as it might be and the imaging is not going to be as solid as it might be so if you send the cartridge off to him you get back a report on a usb stick and you get these shims and the shims will correct for both azimuth and stylus rake angle so it's a very easy setup you just put the shim on there, put the cartridge in, set the overhang. Everything else is going to be set up perfectly. It's so it's let, phenomenal. So let's talk more Riga because uh, part of it was our pros and cons of Riga turntables. Yeah. And I know okay. this is big for Riga. This is tell us about this turntable here. What do you see? Okay, that looks like a P10. That's not the Naya. That's a P10, I believe. Uh, I can't tell. Okay, I think it's okay. a Naya. So what I, I wanted to I... show you. What Anyways. I wanted to show you was this. Okay. So. This is a, a representation of tracking distortion using various uh, geometries. So there's Bearwald, Lofgren, and Stevenson are the main ones that are on there. So, and Unidin. Forget about Unidin for the minute. But so Lofgren is the blue one. And that's Lofgren A. Lofgren B is the red one. And Stevenson is the green one. Can everybody see the colors there? So what you're seeing is a representation of the outer gr outer groove, putting the stylus in the groove over here. I hate doing this backwards. So this is putting <laughs> the stylus in the groove. You can see the distortion is pretty high, no matter which one of these um, geometries that you use. It's pretty high. 
and it gets lower as you get to the first null point, which are these points. There's zero distortion at all of these null points. And you can see this one takes the longest to get to the first null point. That's unity. Forget about that one. At this point, all of them are pretty close together. And then the distortion starts going up. And I know some people who have never seen this are saying to themselves, I better get a CD player because this looks horrible. But you don't hear the distortion. You know, you really don't if it's if it's set up correctly. Um, but what I want to say is the second null point is different for all of these. You can see that it's very different. And you can see there's way more distortion on this one, way more. But it goes down later. So this is the Stevenson one. And this is what Riga gives you if you buy a riga cartridge and use their three-point mount you're getting this curve this this curve up here way more distortion over most of the record and less distortion at the okay. end so someone like myself there's a p6 with the ania pro mc cart that would be me what you're showing and what me kind of records do you play mostly well i mean obviously uh Mar marquee moon rhino high okay. if you play mostly classical music then this curve is great because the the uh, distortion goes away before you get to the end of most records. See, it's way to, it's whereas yeah. these curves it starts distorting way way up, but you get a lot more distortion over the rest of the record. If you play mostly forty fives or newer records that end uh, early before you get to the end of the groove, then uh, some of these other ones are better. I, I prefer Lofgren A. I like having less distortion, and I'm okay with the distortion going up after this point, after this null point. I, I don't want this kind of distortion on my on my okay. records. So what I'm saying to you is if you get a Riga cartridge with the three-point mount, you are stuck with the Stevenson alignment. And I would suggest taking that third screw out, getting a good setup gauge, and experimenting with the various geometries. Pick the one you like best and then put the third screw back in it and you're back where you were. You won't do any, you know, you, you won't have to worry about it if that's what you okay. like. So the Riga, like that's that the, P, the, the P10, my P6 has that issue, the Stevenson uh, curve, I guess you call it all now. The rig, all, the, the, all the ones the using the three screws right. are Stevenson mount and they're do, trying to do you a favor I just don't agree with it. Just like Riga says, don't clean your records. <laughs> that's to me, that's crazy. Well, they I did read, I did read it. Ray said that basically the dust, you know, because the dust will come off when it, sure. when, oh, sure. when the needle's you going through the record. It says he you said that need, you needn't shower either, because if you walk around enough, the dust will come off. Listen, you I was, I was at Roy Gandy's house and I went to Bino's records, which was the greatest used record store in Croydon, but it doesn't exist anymore. And I brought back a stack of great used records and i said to roy let's test your theory out so i put a, a used record on on one of his turntables that were on these um stands that were built into the wall halfway through the record the arm moved st stood in the air like that and just floated because there was so much static electricity and so much dust and dirt on the record so rig is great roy is great some of what they say is fantastic and some of what they say is crazy so. so now let's talk about it. I mean, you haven't reviewed it yet. I think this is the uh, the Naya I, I put up here. No, no, that, that's Pete. Oh, no, that's not? Okay, darn it. Darn it, I took the wrong one. Okay, so I want to talk Naya. I know that's yeah. the big one that, you know, that's the their sort of their their uh, big Grand Slam turntable going forward. Right. I mean, obviously it's priced high, probably was right. it 10,000 USD, I would have to think, if not more. Yeah, it's, it's I think it's ten or eleven thousand. I'm once supposed to, was supposed to be here today or, or any day soon, and I if it was here, I would have walked you through it. Well, so, I have this here too with yeah. some of the key features, as right. you can see here. If you want yep. to just jump on some of the stuff, I think for me, what jumps out is the titanium tone arm is a big thing. I mean, that's and then it says titanium vertical uh, spindle assembly. Can we talk about that or what that all means? So, so let's start from the top. Let's, let's go down the list. Show the list again because I, I haven't absorbed it all. <laughs> all right. So it's a, it's a graphene impregnated carbon fiber skeletal plinth with 10 cast eight foam core. So all of their better uh, turntables have this uh, skeletal core with a, uh, a surface like sandwich of a carbon fiber stiff material. But this is the, the most highly developed one. And then the bearing is now uh, a ceramic bearing 
as opposed to the metal ones that are used in the other arms. And ceramic is a is a better material for vibration reduction. I mean, when a bearing is turning, it's going to be making a vibrating noise. I'd, obviously, the better the bearing, the smoother the bearing, the less vibrational energy would get up into the into the spindle and get into the record and produce problems. So this is a, a better a better one. Now they have a titanium tone with vi well, it says a titanium tone arm, one piece titanium vertical bearing and titanium vertical spindle assembly. So the other thing I want to say at this point, if you've seen any of Riga's demos, they use ball race bearings and they spin them and say, this is the best bearing that we make because it spins longer. You've seen that, I assume, right? But what does that have to do with what happens in a groove of a record when you play? When you play a record, the arm is moving like this, right? How much is it moving? It's not spinning. It's moving a little bit. And so what you really want in a bearing is for the first moment of inertia, the moment of inertia of the arm to be the least when it's starting to move. It doesn't matter if it spins around in circles. That's this really kind of, that's snake oil, actually. And that's something I didn't realize until years later. So I hope this arm's bearing has very low moment of inertia as the arm needs to move not when it's spinning in circles okay let's go let's go back to that did that make sense to everybody have you ever thought about that because it took me years to figure that out i didn't realize that all right so tungsten balance weight shaft and weight so again tungsten is, is a great material for all of this for the same reasons in terms of vibrational energy ceramic top and bottom braces again that's a very stiff material to brace the integration of the where the tone arm sits on the plinth and where the 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 bearing is that spins the platter uh the power supply of course is, is critical to having good sound and controlling the spinning of the platter and the ceramic platter and they've got i guess the machine the, the ceramic platter to have more uh mass around the around the outside of it for the flywheel effect to improve the um the way the platter spins and speed control. And again, they've just gone into everything and made everything as, as good as they can make it for what they believe. But again, you're going to get this, uh, this uh, table and you cannot make any adjustments on the arm other than anti-skating and tracking force. So, so, so no, no different than the one that I have. I mean, I can't make any adjustments that, on my P6. Yeah, in terms of that, yeah. So then the question is, you've spent $12,000 on uh, a turntable. What do you want to know about your cartridge before you install it? Don't you want to know whether the, the uh, stylus rake angle is off on the cartridge that you've installed? Don't you want to know whether the... Um, whether it's been properly built. And don't you want to know, there's another aspect of this, and that's the zenith angle. Now, zenith angle is the angle, I hate using my fingers, but it's, the so putting the stylus into the cantilever, uh, this is the stylus rake angle that I showed you in that picture. But this angle is the zenith angle error. So when you set up a cartridge by yourself, uh, you're told, set it up so the cantilever is parallel to the hash marks, and that's going to produce uh, zero error, tracking error, at the two null points that I showed you on this chart. Okay? But that's assuming that the cantilever has been inserted into the, that the stylus has been inserted into the cantilever perpendicular to the cantilever. You understand what I'm saying? I hope you understand what I'm saying. But now, JR got a very expensive microscope and discovered that the styluses have a, have the manufacturers say it's up to four four degrees off. That's their 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 uh, tolerance. It can be up to four degrees off. So even if you set it exactly correct with the cantilever parallel to the hash marks, you could be up to four degrees off, and you can hear that. But worse. Some of these cartridges come in nine degrees off, <laughs> nine degrees off. And you want to talk about why your records have sibilance? There you go. There you go. 
And I know this is a lot of people are saying, oh no, <laughs> this is terrible. I better get a CD player. But Riga, so the the new Naya. Here's and you're mentioning the cartridge. I mean, here's go back to the if you look back here, do you know much about their new cartridge that they're coming out with that's gonna be part of this uh, turntable? This is a uh, this is an a, a, Alfetta or a, what are they calling it? This is the Al, Alphelian. Alphelian. Alphelian to MC, I think right. it's called. I'm feeling your, your pain. Um, I'll be getting one of those to review. And um, their cartridges are good. I don't think that they're the top shelf cartridges available, but they're good. Um, so, you know, they're going to hate me for saying that. But I'm going to say that they're good but again there are going to be manufacturing tolerances there too and um I'll, I'll i'll check the stylus rake angle that's one of the things i do i check the stylus rake angle i check everything that i'm capable of checking i cannot check um the uh zenith angle error i can't but what i can do is i have a gauge that will let me set it up four degrees off to one side three degrees off to one side two degrees and supposedly correct and then up to four degrees off on the other side and i will take the time to listen to all of those and people who have been doing this report that they can hear it when it's off and they set it according yes so i think you know how we've seen vinyl go up relative to cds over the last couple of years you've been you know since 86 you've been saying at one point now as of today michael you screwed everything up Everyone's going to listen <laughs> no, to this and say, oh, my God, no. I don't want to deal no, with all these, all this stuff. I'm going back to CDs. We're going to see CDs go up now because of this video. No, no. no knowledge is good. And I'm not <laughs> no, trying is. to get people to go crazy here. I'm saying if you have this civil problem, you can't get rid of it and you don't know what it is and you and you constantly have it. Um, there's, there's things you can try. You can so, try it purposely setting your zenith angle assuming you have a line contact stylus or one of one of the more sophisticated styluses in your cartridge uh you even on a riga you can set the zenith angle off purposely by three or four degrees and listen and then you can set it off by three degrees and two degrees just use your hash marks on your gauge as a reference turning your anti-skating off and see whether it goes away and if it goes away in a certain setting and your records sound better, then leave it there. I think so. Let's move on from this. Um, I like this question here. I mean, there's a lot of debate. Okay, moving coil versus moving magnet cartridge. Which ones do you, do you prefer and why? Well, moving coil cartridges certainly will give you more detail and more resolution and get more out of the groove. And they also create more problems. And, uh, you know, a, a great moving magnet cartridge is, is also a really good choice like uh an ortofon to like i just recommended an ortofon 2m black to um to patrick leonard who produced amused to death for roger waters and produced two of the last three leonard cohen records and who has a new record coming out that i supervise the vinyl on and it's it's going to be so great when this comes out so he had a, a clear audio virtuoso and his cleaning people broke it and uh, I said, why don't you get a moving magnet cartridge where you can replace the stylus yourself in case they get. And so he got that and he's thrilled. And he hasn't played records in a long time. And now he's thrilled. So, um, yeah, look, a good moving magnet cartridge is a good choice. And a good moving coil cartridge is a better choice with the proper turntable and the proper setup. Say, and, the and I was going to say... And I was going to say that. So like an MC, I mean, because it's more, it has more detail, a little bit more higher frequency, I would assume. And of course it is lighter, right? Uh, than, a, than an MM. The, uh, the moving uh, part yeah. is lighter. It's, yeah. it's a coil as opposed to a magnet. Also yeah. moving iron cartridges are really good. The ones that Soundsmith makes and, and Grado mm -hmm. makes can be very good. Of course, you can't really put a Grado in a Riga because of where the motor is. You're going to get home. So that's mm -hmm. not compatible. And that's a question. Um, I have a P6. I have a little bit of hum. I've had other viewers. We were talking about Riga's last week. Some of them have hum. Do we? Do you have any idea what that might be from? Yeah. Other than maybe if a the hum. If the hum changes when you move the arm across the surface, you're getting uh, your cartridge is creating a magnetic interference that's causing the hum. You probably have either a Grado or a Soundsmith cartridge. If you have another kind of cartridge it should it, that shouldn't happen but the problem another problem with rigas and i don't know why they do this they do not 
uh, float the ground. They don't have the ground wire separated from the wires that that no, carry exactly. the signal. They exactly. ground the uh, ground to the ring of the RCA plug, and that's more convenient. You don't have a separate wire, but you can't play with ground. You know, grounding is a very strange thing. Whether the <laughs> ground wire, whether it sounds better with the ground grounded to the back of your phono preamp or not is a matter of trying it you can't do it with with a riga and that's when i got when we got my riga i'm like where's the ground wire i mean like, yeah I, mean, wasn't, I wasn't used to that again these are the these are the riga quirks that that they do that they believe and um you either buy into it or you don't if you have the problem i don't know what to tell you 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 just have to and we're not shilling for Riga. I definitely am not shilling for Riga here. Anymore. The Western I don't sell. I don't sell any any hi-fi at all. <laughs> I don't own a Riga turntable. I've got you know different. Okay, turntables. we're we're going we're going and, over and, today. And, and, wait a second. Wait a second. I'm explaining the problems with Riga turntables. Oh, you're still going. I'm explaining that their cartridges are not the greatest cartridges. They're they're fine. They're not the greatest. And for the same money, I think there were some better ones out there, but. They don't hate me. They're not going to not send me this turntable. They live in the real world. Please, I don't sell anything. I don't sell records. <laughs> you know, I don't. Well, you have one record that you sell. Come on. Yes, I yes, and I have you it know. here, and I'll show it. Show it. You, know? you can show it. Yeah. Yeah. Go. I am, and this record. And if if, uh, if you're overseas, Michael Forty Five sells it. So this is Rufus Reed presents Kalen Cardello, and Rufus Reed is a very well known uh, bass player, a great bass player. He's played with a lot of the jazz greats over the years, and uh, and Kalen Cardello is a young uh, upstart. A he uh, he's a wonderful pianist, and I went to a, a live concert that the two of them played at, and it was the first time they ever played together. And after the first number, which took my breath away, uh, I <laughs> turned to my friend Robin and I said, "And Robin is the guy that imports Miyajima Labs cartridges, so and I don't sell those either." I said, "Robin, it's too bad this wasn't being recorded." And he said, but it is. Our friend Duke Marcos, who's a really good recording engineer, is back there recording everything on six channels of 96K 24-bit digital. So it's digital, yes. And so I got permission from Rufus and Kalen to uh, release this on vinyl. And uh, I had Duke send us a rough mix. And I spent like six weeks going back and forth, back and forth with the equalization of how the piano sounded and how the bass sounded and these these are difficult instruments you know there's nothing more difficult than a bass stand up bass and piano and we got it just the way we liked it and then i sent it to joe harley the tone poet i said joe i have two instruments on the stage what do you suggest we do for placement of the instruments and joe i was gonna, I was gonna ask i was just gonna ask you that this is great and joe had certain ideas so there were different microphones on the left and right hand of uh, of kaylin and I hate I hate being the pianist. I don't want to buy a record where the left hand is here and the right hand is over there. <laughs> that's what the that's what the guy playing the piano hears. I'm not him. I'm in the audience. So I didn't want that. So so his suggestion, which was a good one, he said, see if uh, if Duke can mix it. So the alignment of the, of the two hands is mm. uh, where Kalen is hearing it, but front to back, and not so extreme so that's what it sounds like when you're hearing it live i was about to say so more of the club setting it would sound like yeah. if you sat in the club listening to him yeah. live that would be what you wanted yeah. i mean now, you only hear you only hear that slightly obviously when yeah. the sounding board is pushing the sound out you don't hear left and right but we mixed it that way we put the piano in a certain place left to right we put the bass a certain place left to right and then of course the audience is spread and and when rufus talks and explains what's going on he's in in the middle and then we did the eq just the way I liked it because I'm paying for it. I want it to sound good on my stereo. And then uh, and I think I've got a good stereo. So then I sent the files to Bob Ludwig, just as a, I said, Bob, you're retiring soon and you've done so many great records over the years. And, I, and I've been friends with Bob for a long time. We had a fight once. I won't get into that, but we, we became friends again. And uh, it was a very short fight. And I sent him the files. I said, Bob, you should have this. And he goes, you know, I'm retiring soon. I want to master this for you. Hmm. So I said to my partner, you know what? We're not doing this for the money. If we lose money, we don't care. We just I said, whatever Bob charges, we're just going to do it. So Bob, he mastered it for vinyl. He mastered it for CD. He mastered it for streaming. And uh, and then I decided, where do I want to have this uh, cut? So I went to Matthew Luthans, who works with Kevin Gray. 
and we had it mastered on um, on the mastering labs. Doug Sachs's refurbished mastering lab tube cutting system, which in is Kansas? at Kansas, Adam's place in Kansas. Hey man, I tell you, he's gonna do a good job for you, man. No, this is gonna be it's gonna <clears> be good, <throat> man. And so Matthew cut it, and the lacquers came out so good. And so that's how think, it was done. And and then we're going to get into mastering engineers. And then you're, you're for anyone that's in North America, Acoustic Sounds is carrying on their website as well. Yeah. And in Germany, Michael 45, uh, yes. Michael 45, who gets into your face with the big glasses and puts the record in front of you. And let's compare this pressing with that. Pre He's selling them at his store. Okay. So they're um, great. And so we were last, last part at last sort of, Part of this uh, the show today, we're going to do master engineers. And now you mentioned Matt, who works with Kevin Gray. Matt could be one yep. of those up and coming guys. He works for Kevin Gray. He's you know, he's in California. He's going to Kansas. Yeah. He's working with Doug Sachs and stuff. I mean, this could be the next Kevin Gray, Bernie Grenman, um, Chris Bellman. Let's talk about. Well, he's him been he's been around for a while. He's not like yep. he's not like a a Ute, and he's really no. good. He does good work. Yes, and he worked with Kevin, and uh, he did a great job on our record, and uh, you know. And and Chris did a great job on so so I um this is a test pressing of of Patrick Leonard's record. If you like progressive rock, looks like a white album. Oh, it's a test pressing. Sorry, test it's pressing. Test this okay. record. So he's got Tony Levin is the bassist. If you like, you know King Crimson. Tony Levin's played the bass. Uh, Martin Barr from Jethro Tull is the guitarist. Uh, Ian Anderson's adding some flute and a bunch of other really great musicians are on this. And yeah, it's a digital recording in 9624. Sorry, but um, it sounds so good. It's and Chris Bellman cut this one and it's, you know, I mean, Patrick played it yesterday for the first time and he's, he's, he's over the moon with how good it sounds. I'll be bringing and it to the Florida show. I'll be bringing this to Axpona. I'll be bringing it to Germany. I'll bring it to your house. If you pay me enough money, but okay. You know, it's it's awesome. It's it's the bottom end on this record. It will flap your pants. So mastering engineers, that's gonna we're gonna we're gonna the last half hour of this of this gig here today. I want to talk about that. You know, I mean, I've had pretty much the whole everyone on. My my dream is to get Bob Ludwig on before he retired. And I, as you as as you know, I did ask him, and he politely yep. said no. But uh, let's talk about it. what do you got there. I found the Riga book, a vibration measuring machine, and. Uh, you know, if you're a Riga fan, you might want to get this book because it goes through the whole history of Riga. That, so that sounds so X-rated, that title. My God. Yeah. Well, that's another kind of vibration measuring machine. There you go. <laughs> so, so it's it's a really it's a very good book. It's divided up into the history of Riga. You learn about where the name came from. You know. Uh, it, so G A is Gandhi, and the and the his original partner was the first part of the name. And you know, I visited the factory a number of times. First time was when they had one building and you know vinyl was okay but not doing great next time i went back they had two built they doubled the size of the building and they were still running out of room so uh, no one has to uh, feel sorry for riga as far as uh you know saying everything they make isn't the greatest product and blah 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 so they're doing great and they make great great products yes they do and as a set it and forget it turntable it's among the top Yep. Okay. okay. Master and engineers go. Engineers, yes. What do you want to talk about? Well, I mean, we were decided that we're going to talk about master engineers. I mean, we've yep. got the Kevin Grays and talk to the Chris Bellmans. I mean, um, you know, Bob Ludwig. Yep. Um, let's talk about and there's John their, Weber at, their processes and stuff. Yeah. There's John Weber at air studios and there's race staff. who used to cut at air studios. There are the guys that cut at ERC, you know, with yep. all tube gear. There's that, that facility, they did a cut of I'll say they did a cut of Crosby, Stills, and Nash from the original master tape, and what they do is very interesting. They just take the tape, and they cut it flat. They don't do anything to the tape, and you know not every record can be left alone. Well, and you're talking and you're talking ERC just so the folks know. Yeah, home, right? yeah, yeah. So aren't the ERCs, from my understanding, they're just an EQ tape, and they just take the EQ master and just cut it. Without any adjustments, the original pressing, and they give you the document. And their yeah. customers, uh, their customers obviously have a lot of money because they're expensive records. I can't and, afford it. People who don't like those don't buy them. But you know, so uh, 
they just give you what's on the record and they use a, a vacuum to an, a restored Lyrec Ortofon cutting system used back in the day. It works great for classical music. I mean, there's some of those and great for jazz and less great for rock. Uh, but still, that's what people want. And so that's what they do. So I, I want to ask one thing. So, I mean, a lot of my records, I've got a lot of Canadian um, rock records from the you know 70s and 80s. Now I'm finding, I mean, be, this is before we had BG and the Dead Wax or Kevin yeah. Gray and the Dead Wax or Chris Bellman. I'm finding out more and more that Doug Sachs was a big part of, of doing a lot of these mastering that I didn't really realize before. And Doug Sachs, um, I don't think it's talked in, about enough, even though, you know, we obviously he's passed away and, you know, rest, oh, of course, rest in peace. But great was like talk to me about doug Sachs. i want to learn more about this gentleman so and by the way doug Sachs is a guy that does not believe in one steps when he passed away so, so he would poo poo on the mofi one step right he now. has reasons right? why he doesn't think any of the one steps are okay it, he doesn't think it's it's a it you know it's theoretically gets you a couple of steps closer because you're not plating and plating and peeling and plating and peeling. He, he he didn't like that but so doug had the mastering lab tml and did you see tml on these canadian presses is that what you saw i've seen that before yeah, too absolutely I've, cool. I've always wondered about that yeah so so when he first started he didn't have his tml stamp and that's why the early who's next he cut mm. the original who's next but it didn't have the tml but there's a way to tell it's his okay. and and i didn't even i didn't know that the american one and the british the british original who's next on track records, one side was cut by Doug and oh wow, and done the rest of it done overseas. And obviously, uh, Pete Townsend was a fan because a lot of the Who records ha are cut by by Doug Sachs and had the TML stamp in it. So Doug had three lathes: TML M, that was his main lathe; TML S, the, the secondary lathe, and he had a third lathe, and I, I forget what that one was. But uh, so, there were connoisseurs who prefer one lathe over the other, but I don't, I, I'm sorry. I don't get into that. So, so does Chad have those lathes now that yes. did he have all, well, yeah, all he has the them? main lathe. He has okay. the main one. I'm not sure he's got all three. He may have put those in, in mothballs. He's got the yep. main one that's sufficient. <clears throat> but when you buy a record, you are buying a stereo system in reverse. So a cutting system is a stereo system in reverse. Instead of playing back a record, you're making a record. So um, Kevin Gray's cutting system has so improved over the years. When he was at Acoustech, and Acoustech was his cutting system when he was at uh, RTI. He had a complete cutting system at RTI, and that was Acoustech. Mm -hmm. And Chad was involved in that, and um, RTI was involved in that, and a lot of uh, blue notes were cut there for Chad. At, at 45 RPM. So you can buy a double 45 cut by Kevin Gray at Acoustic. And you can buy the same record cut at 33 at Coherent. And the 33 cut at Coherent will sound way better than the 45 cut at Acoustic. And I've demonstrated that for people again and again and again. And they're always amazed. So this notion that 45 is definitely better. All things being equal, it's better, of course. But when you have two different cutting systems, all things aren't equal. And Kevin did a lot of work on his system. You know, oh, he, he has. I mean, talking to him, I mean, he's very proud of the system that he has right now. Of course, he's been able to yeah. do all valve as well uh, with a couple of his with with, of course, with Chris and Eddie. You can he can cut valve or solid state. He's got all class A uh, solid state electronics, Amazing. and it depends on what the customer wants. And it depends. You know what? What annoys me the most is when people get on his case. When something comes out not good, and th they they blame him, why did he? He shouldn't cut from a digital source. He shouldn't. He shouldn't do this. He shouldn't do that. He has. He is just a service. He provides a service and does what the customer wants. He's not making the final decision. He's not an arbiter of what what the customer wants. The customer wants what the customer wants, and. You know. So Kevin will make the, these master engineers, Kevin Gray, Chris Spellman, Vernon, they get the test pressings and then give them to the customer. Such could be Chad. It could be Rhino. And they will have their team of people that will listen to it and decide if that's the customer. Not always. Or... Not always. Some, but oh. no, nobody's listening some of the times. A lot okay. of the times nobody's listening. But we don't know that. We're not in the room. No, but a lot of times they're not. They send the tape over and whatever they get, they get. And other times they care. Mm-hmm. To get it their way, it depends. 
so Doug Sachs, absolute legend. It sounds like. I mean, a lot yeah. more, a lot more of these records that we have from the '70s are a Doug Sachs or '80s stuff or Doug Sachs. A lot of them are Ludwig. Now another fellow, I mean, did a lot of the Hendrix stuff was uh, George Marino. Talk about George. George I, interview, I interviewed George, and uh, the interview with George is on uh, the DVD that I made. 21st Century Vinyl had a you know turntable set of DVD, which is still selling and it's still available. And people say, uh, you know, oh, you have all this equipment. Where'd you get the money? It's none of your business where I got the money, but uh, I bought everything I got. And um, it's not from my wife's uh, <laughs> my wife's account. <laughs> that DVD so sold a lot of DVDs. I've sold like at this point almost eighteen thousand DVDs. And when I made the DVD in the in the nineties, no, it was the early two thousands. I made the DVD, and I I spoke to a company that makes. Um, instructional dvds and i said look i made i made an instructional dvd how many what's the shelf life and how many can i sell and they said well it's a four-year thing unless you're jane fonda and you're doing a workout dvd it's four <laughs> years and and you can sell you know four thousand that's that's a good number so base your price how much you're selling it for on that and they said what do you what's the what are you selling what's the what's the instructional thing about i said it's how to set up a turntable and they goes oh half half everything two thousand and you know <laughs> So I so I retail it for thirty dollars and I wholesaled it for fifteen dollars, and I've sold uh, I've sold uh, eighteen thousand. No, good for you, amazing. It's pretty good money, you know. It's good money. So George Marino is on that DVD. He's on that. So tell tell us a little bit your experience with George, because I mean, obviously he did he did the Hendrix. He would have done the reissues for Hendrix through I yeah. think it was Acoustic Sounds a years years back before yeah. uh, the he, UHQRs. Yeah. He did a lot of cutting for Chad. He did a, he did a, a Getz Gilberto. Uh, if That's you right. say yeah. you a Sterling stamp with no name in it, okay, in the early days, it was was a George cut. He didn't put he didn't like to put his name on records. What I'm finding too, a lot of these guys didn't put their name on records until probably the early '90s, if around there is well, when it really started to happen. It was earlier, you know. Lee Hulko was the first guy. Lee Hulko was the first guy to make an art out of cutting, and also Bell Sound. You'll see SF mm. Sam Feldman cut mm -hmm. a lot of. And Bell Sound had a great cutting system too. They cut really loud and really clean, and not always, but really great. So a lot of people are connoisseurs of, of cutting engineers, and and for very good reason. You know, a lot of people love, uh, you know, Harry T. Moss at EMI, and that's one of the fun things about this whole hobby. Or all you, know, you get into the weeds and you learn all this stuff. I mean, for how many decades was I buying records and not knowing any of it? But we talk buy... we talk about it all the time. Like we didn't look at the matrix now. or spot the back. <laughs> now, I mean, not right. back then. Now you're like, oh my god, what is it? Right? That's right. <laughs> you know, and, Le and LH with Sterling was great, and RL with Sterling. You know, yeah. And can you beat those? A lot of times you can't. And BG, you know, BG on the grooves of records, on the inner groove, yeah. can't beat a lot of those too. Question for you about Bernie Grenman. Did he not uh, master the original Doors self-titled 67? Was he not a part of that with Electra? Was that was his, one of his first gigs? I don't think I don't think he cut I don't think he cut that. I don't think Bernie was I involved in that. I swear he, he did. Yeah. Uh you could go on Discogs and find out. I don't think Electra used him. I know uh he I'm not sure. You could look it up and see who cut it. I want and the reason why reason Reason I want to say this because I think there was a interview that Chad did with Bernie at the studio, and Bernie even mentioned to Chad that he cut doors back. Yeah, I, don't, I, I wouldn't don't. believe it. I mean, I don't know if I believe that if I were you, son. I don't know. This uh, I think this guy does a very good job. But even even on the first do two Doors albums, you can get a yellow, you know, a gold label original pressing, and there in the inner groove area, you'll see that there were different. Yeah, Ber mix. Yeah, the mix. Yeah, he worked with Bruce Botnick, no doubt. Yeah, Bruce Bott okay. is still one of the great, you know, engineers. So, going back to going back to the Doors, I mean, if you get a um, analog productions forty five RPM with the Doors, the box set or the or the the single albums, those are all cut by Doug Sachs, just so everyone knows on the cutting system that Chad has at the church right now in Kansas. Correct. That's right. And uh, you know, Chad got the original tapes when he could. The first Doors album is is a cop tape copy because the original tape disappeared, and. Uh, which is sad. A lot of those it tapes, believe me, they didn't disappear. They were disappeared, and uh, and they're in private hands. Hold, hold like, on, hold on. What does that What does that mean? Someone stole them? Is that what you're saying? Oh, there are lots of stolen tapes out there. Yeah, no doubt. No and doubt. that's going back and to some things, tapes so were, were returned. Some tapes were caught. They were you know and returned. And I'm not going to mention names, but 
doesn't matter. So question. So this is a this is a really good question. This is a question I have. So I mean, going back, I don't want to talk too much about Steely Dan, but when Bernie um, cut the UHQR Steely Dan, he had a EQ'd copy that he made when he first mastered it in '77. So was this a standard practice for engineers back then to have these copies as a safety no, and Bernie, then keep them? Bernie didn't have it. Okay. It, uh, UMG had it and, and it didn't oh. get burned in the fire, luckily. And they okay. returned, you know, they, they sent it to him. A lot of things that were said to have been lost in the fire were not lost. I hope everybody watching this saw my tour of, of UME's. Uh, of UMG's I love that tour. Tour. That oh. tour. That tour was awesome. That was good. I hope you saw that one. That was one of the, that was one of the best things I ever did was to get to see that place. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. Watch mm -hmm. that if you haven't. It's, it's on my YouTube channel. Um, it was like a day with my, with my jaw, jaw drop. A draw drop to see all that stuff a lot of well, stuff was burnt up but a lot wasn't yeah. i so, remember you had, you had texted me just before you went to that you were freaking out that day because you're pretty excited about yeah, I was that. Freaking out. <laughs> it was it was great <laughs> i know you were that was, a, that, was a, that was a fun day i've had a lot of fun days like that so uh what was oh so bernie got the tape back bernie had the led zeppelin all the master tapes of led zeppelin and kind of blue three track sitting on the floor for years years because at, there was a point in time when they didn't care the labels didn't care i i go visit bernie and i say bernie the led zeppelin tapes are still there because i called them to pick them up but they haven't picked them up and the same with the uh, this you know sony had sent him a kind of blue three track master tape they didn't ask for it back now they won't send tapes out to anybody pretty much so that you're talking the classic record days of bernie cut for classic records that zeppelin yeah. and the kind of blue yeah, yeah. and i Can went to, i went that? to out I went out there when they did when classic did Tommy when you know the classic version of Tommy. Mm -hmm. They wanted to have an original pressing, track pressing to compare to the tape, which was a smart idea because we put the tape up, and I was there for that. Which is so much, how much fun could you have in life if you're a record freak? Yeah, and uh, and they played the original pressing and they played the tape and they there was a disparity in certain sections. It got they sped up when they mastered the track version of Tommy, they sped it up in places because they felt it was lagging. Now, if you were doing a re so I'm asking everybody out there, if you're doing a reissue of Tommy, would you put the tape up and just duplicate the tape and cut lacquers? Or would you duplicate the original pressing where they made the decision to speed it up in certain places? I would I knew duplicate, I would speed it up. But I knew there was tape issues with the speed. That's why if you do the Abbey Road cut, the plagiarism plagi process basically um, corrects those speed issues from no, the No, that's original. a different kind of no, don't 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 confuse those two things. Those okay. are, that, that's a speed error that's not intended. The speed okay. differences on Tommy were they sped it up on purpose to okay because they felt it was the it, the energy was lagging, people weren't enjoying it, so they they sped it up. That's a that's a different thing. I see. Okay. So what I would say is if you were doing a reissue and you were in charge of a reissue and you compared the original tape with the original master, uh, the original pressing and found that they were actually speeding it up a great deal, would you duplicate that? That's what they did when Classic reissued it. Now, if you had uh, Beggar's Banquet, which was at the wrong speed by accident, you'd want to fix that. Right. I would. You know. I didn't did. know that. It was slow. You know, tape machines back in the day, you turned them on in the morning and they were at a different speed the next morning. So oh, there you go. Different types yeah, of machines can run at wrong speeds. Yeah. <laughs> and and change day to day. You know, that's how Kind of Blue got messed up when they first reissued it. So, so going back to the Kind of Blue now that um, it was it reissued by U UHQR Analog Productions, that was all yeah. Bernie basically got the speed correction back on that one so that's the the most i guess authentic version of kind of blue the way it's supposed understand. to be and that, right. yeah i mean he bernie had well no that, that was done already you know those those metal parts well, that's right classic that. records yeah 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 that, that that was a great period of time but when, when mike hobson decided to do this vinyl has not yet come back and and hobson put the money up and did all of this and produced a lot of great records and 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 to this day, he doesn't get enough credit for that. So when all these stories are written about the resurgence of vinyl, and they yes. don't mention classic records, <laughs> and they don't mention Chad either. You know, they, they mentioned Record Store Day. Record Store Day is why vinyl came back. Well, 
to a certain degree, that's true. If you look at the curve of when record sales went up, it's when record store day started. But that that's all true. of the infrastructure of all of this was Chad and Hobson and a few other people. He took the words out of my mouth. Definite pioneer in this. I mean, 19, Absolutely. what was it? Was it 93 classic started? Was that the year around there? I want to say. No, it, was a little, it was after that. I've lost track okay. of time. I could pull out test yeah. pressings and keep the dates. That's fine. Yeah. So, and later, Tom Beery, Tom Beery did did all these Warner Brothers records in the two in the early two thousands. He did he did a Joni Mitchell Blue. He did the Van Morrison Street Choir and and uh, um, Astral Weeks and a bunch of others. And that was done at a time when he'd go to the executives at Warner Brothers and say, "I want to put out some vinyl." And they went, "Do whatever you want. No one cares about that." They didn't care. <laughs> So a few years later, uh, Sonny will take over that now, and we'll ruin it. Why should you do, do good records? <laughs> I, I'm sorry, Warner Brothers. They put good, good stuff out too. You got a good. Well, here's the thing. Okay, so a lot of chatter all the time. I want to see Chad do Led Zeppelin. He's got the plates for Led Zeppelin. Why can't he do the UHQR? I mean, he is there, have, are we? I thought he doesn't he have the parts for those. He doesn't have the parts for those. Okay, so question is, will we ever see a? All analog reissue remastered of the Zeppelin catalog in our lifetime on vinyl. It what could happen. Think? It could happen if if all the ducks in a row line up. Because Craig Kalman, you know, I interviewed Craig Kalman, who's a really interesting guy. He's the he's the CEO of Atlantic Records. He's a relatively I saw young that. guy. Yeah. And the the numbers on that video are not that high. And it's really disappointing to me some of the really good ones and it's not because i want to build up my site but it's a he's an interesting guy and he's a vinyl fanatic and he runs atlantic records and you know one day in i guess it was probably in the mid 2010 you know 2012 or so i was walking down the street on 14th street in manhattan in the in the in the dog days the hottest days of the summer and i it was a lot of traffic, so I had to stop every couple of every couple, like every ten cars I had to stop. And there was Craig Kalman schlepping bags of records and stopping and putting <laughs> them down and sweating and schlepping bags of records. I went, Craig, how are you? <laughs> and that video is really worth watching if you haven't yeah. seen it. Watch that video. One. He, he's another one of these heroes in this whole in this whole thing. So I think Led Zeppelin could happen. I suspect that that Jimmy Page will let it happen. I hope. There you go. He says it won't allow it. Jimmy Page won't allow it as far as he's concerned. His remasters are the yeah, best well, out there. Look, Done. <laughs> uh, uh, Jam Paul, Jeff Jam Paul, who's uh, the Doors manager, wasn't letting the tapes out either because uh, the, the digital remaster that was done for that that um, skin box set that came out, that's the best it was going to be. And the tapes aren't usable and blah, blah, blah. And Chad, Chad just said, hey, man, I'll give you a couple more dollars. At some point, there was enough money and they did it happen. So, you know, money talks. So and never say never. Yeah. If you, well, I mean, obviously Warner, you know, Warner could probably could do it before, say, Chad could do it. But I mean, again, money talks. I mean, does Paige want more money? Because I mean, we know it's going to sell out. Yeah. Who knows? Uh, we'll see. Uh, I, I, I would think, the Zeppelin catalog th think, think about Bernie's the Zeppelin cuts, catalog. Bernie's cuts of the Led Zeppelin catalog are really, really good. And the stairway, the 45 RPM stairway to heaven. Do you know that one? The I don't never heard it. Oh, I've got one here. I'd play it for you. It's awesome. It's mm. amazing. Th they should do that. Do that. F get that. Do a 45 RPM 12 inch single of, of Stairway to Heaven. And uh, I bring but that. But I like, the, I like, I mean, obviously, we'd all like to see Chad do it with UHQR, but I mean, maybe Atlantic runs and does the full box set um, on hi fi vinyl or something like that, remastered from the tapes at some point, you know, with Jimmy Page and Kevin Gray in the same studio together. I mean, you could see that happen eventually, too. There's a possibility. Well, I, I don't know if Kevin would cut it or I don't know who would cut it because, uh, you know, it could be Bernie cutting it. Bernie cut, did a great job cutting them for the first go round. I was going to say it depends. It depends. I mean, if it's you know, if, if Chad gets the rights, or if Atlantic or Rhino get the rights, I don't know what will happen. But well, I I, I say never say the, never. Money talks. Rhino catalog. You know, Chad has different people cutting for different reasons. Yeah. You know, Chad, he's pretty fanatical about it. So like when he was releasing records where the masters were in Europe, he had guys in Europe cutting it. He had Will, Will and Mackie cutting it uh, at Emil Berliner's Berliner Studios, which at that point was in Hanover, Germany. Hmm. I went there. That was fun seeing the vaults there. Thank God, a lot of the stuff that was burnt in the, in the Universal Fire, there was one off the Masters store there in, in Hanover. And Willem Mackey was there. 
and doing a lot of cutting. And then all their analog machines were out in the hallway covered with plastic. They weren't, weren't using them anymore. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So I know there was a question. I mean, do you have one favorite master engineer or you just, that's like, it's to the blanket statement. Oh, I, mean, I can't no. imagine. I don't think any, I don't think anyone has. Cause I, I don't personally, I like all of their work. Like, I mean, for who's different your reasons. favorite wife. No, I only have one wife. Uh, it, it's for different <laughs> records, different things work better. You know, uh, I like Kevin for jazz and Kevin's got great rock also. Kevin's really great cutting jazz. They, and they all have different systems. You know, Bernie's got the Heiko. He's, he's got a, a different, a different cutting head. He's got different machines, different board. They're all different. So I, I don't have a favorite. I like what Ryan does a lot. You know, Ryan cut the, uh, cut the UHQR of, uh, of the White Stripes record. That's, That's right. and the, fantastic. And the Marleys, I think, too, right? Yeah, and Ryan, Ryan's great. And, you know, Ryan was is like 50 now. So when he first started, he was... And, and Joe Nino Hernandez is also great. Joe is good, and too, so, yeah. Yeah, um, there's, there's asking, that there are young people there. Why Chad doesn't have the metal parts for Led Zeppelin? I thought he bought the entire catalog from Classic Records, is the question. No comment. On that one, yeah. on that one, uh, they wanted them back they took them i've back. asked chad that before and he wasn't able to say something that's fair enough i mean i hope i don't again, get in trouble for that but on that one just... I'm, you know he, he has most of the metal parts of most of okay. the things that's what he said but, yeah yeah not everything and so you know, it depends on the deal that was struck you know that one may but have again, been when you're done when you're done metal parts come back or but again it makes no so different it makes no so different to you have the metal parts if you don't have the license for it who gives a shit i mean really that's right you can't do much what with are you it. Gonna, well then you can just go into the pressing plant in the middle of the night and set up a press. And hey, you, know. you could take selfies of yourself. Look, I've got Zeppelin's metal parts here and selfie it and put it on Facebook. That's all, all yeah, you can you do know, with that. People say, what would you like to see re reissued that's not reissued? <laughs> so the first thing, you know, we need the Beatles catalog in stereo cut from the tapes. I it's promote like, that all. I promote that all the time on my show. I 100% I mean, agree. Not to mention the, the mono box that came out continuing to be should be pressed again why why did they stop that oh it got too expensive so i said i said to the the, the head of apple i said why don't you just uh raise the price well we're for the proletariat i said please the box that's not cheap to begin with now people are paying 1200 dollars for the box 1200 i think there's some for 2000 i mean they're going i had a question for you and i've never been able to get a, an answer from anyone i've talked to folks at abbey roads now the mono box set i have it up here somewhere how many did they press do we have an idea? I don't know. What do you think? 20,000, 30,000? I mean, it's got to be. I, I don't want to speculate because I don't know. I hate speculating about what I don't know. It, it, but it, bu it bugs me, though, because, I mean, it, it's got to be. It doesn't have. I think it's less than we think. I don't know the number, but they pressed a lot, and uh, it was. It, they sold them all, and uh, it was Here, great to, to go there and hear it. You know, that was like one of these dreams, like. Yeah. <laughs> Although my stereo sounds better than <laughs> my stereo sounds better than what I heard there, believe it or not. But you know, the tape sounded really good. There was a and there's a picture on the net, and I guess that because these were print these were pressed at optimal. These are the optimal yeah, ones, yeah. the mono. So yeah. at the optimal factory, there was basically pallets of the mono box sets on pallets, and I, I saw. I know there's a picture out there if you just Google yeah. that, and I mean. Someone put up there a hundred thousand units. I don't know. That seems a little high for the I, mono I box. No, I don't think it was that. Many. And I was I visited the Optimal also. It's, it was it's yeah. a great pressing plant. But you know the interesting thing is Optimal. People say, "What's your favorite pressing plant?" Each pressing plant has different presses. So Optimal has modern presses like the Phoenix Alphas, and uh, yeah, Joy Division. Good, good luck finding that. Getting the tapes. A lot of the tapes don't exist anymore, or the tapes are, are like. Joy, you know, Joy Division. Joy Division's Reiner or Warner, right? If I'm not mistaken, I think I've yeah, asked but that. The, yeah. the you know, the, the tapes are, uh, those people who made those original recordings, they weren't too careful with, with what they had. They, and they were pretty <laughs> drugged up and you know, they found tapes in a box left someplace and, you know, it got wet. It's, it's a mess. That's why the some of these original pressings are like, they're the thing. And I would like to see my my going forward. I'd like to see more box sets of of, of audio file pressed albums going forward, just because and getting the one off, having to wait six months for the next one, or just having one. I want to, you know, maybe they decide to basically start pressing five of the of of 
of the um, you know the, the first five albums of an of a, of a of a band and just have that as a box yeah. set. And so it's harder to sell box sets of bands that were not like the Beatles or the Stones. And then well, some there's, people, say, but there's other ones. You got ACDC, you got ZZ Top. All these guys, I mean, deserve yeah. I think a pretty good uh, remastering in a hi-fi setting, wouldn't you think? Yeah. Well, those guys, you know, the guy from ZZ Top is an audiophile, crazy audiophile. So there you go. I love when when the guys are audiophiles. So well. Beatles, Beatles from the original master tapes. None of this reimagined Giles Martin remix. I just think take it from the tapes, get you know a yeah, Bernie I mean, or whoever to cut it. I'm not, I'm not against those, but uh, if I sit people down. I say here, here's what Giles did with Abbey Road, and he, you know, he put George in the center on, and and he's the big guitar solo. You know, yeah. when each guy yeah. takes it. The, the the threading of the guitar one here one here one here that's nice as opposed to the well, that's it you know, that's, that's a, the, and the on the song of the andy does that with all four yeah. of the guitars or the three of the guitar yeah. solos but yeah. you know what when you play an original pressing for people a good a british original uh i did that at expona one year they had uh a big room a giant room with these big von schweikert speakers B big speakers that are enough to fill the room wow and, and i brought an original British Abbey Road, and I played it. Played the whole side too, and people in the audience were cry, they were cr not just tearing; they were crying from it. It was so, it was so great, and when it was over, they were all like, "Thank you for playing that," it was, because they'd never heard it sound like the American pressing is is awful. They'd never heard that sound that I way. Didn't, yeah, the, I mean the Capital pressings are awful from north america i mean i got yeah. the canadian version i mean you can't, they're almost even more awful. they're <laughs> almost they're almost unlistenable okay i guess, i think i'm gonna say they are unlistenable because i'll never listen to them again especially when i got the mono box set i, I mean agree. i'd rather i'd rather listen to the remix and i would you know than a than a you know original capital press and those are brutal i know it's, it's sad that that happened uh although some of them have diff you know they're different some of the people like the track order of rubber soul and revolver of the american one some people like the way the uh things were manipulated you know by dave dexter where he added reverb or did all these things so the kids would like some of those and again if you grew up with those there's a certain thing nostalgia in that and when they hear the british originals they go that just sounds too quiet and too dry and you know it doesn't have the rock and roll energy that the, that the american ones had so there are japanese pressings of those masters that sound pretty good right if you like that so sound. we're gonna we're gonna leave it right away one thing though um and talking going back to original intent now the giles remix of the beatles i mean we don't know if the original intent if john lennon or george harrison would have actually liked what they're listening to from the giles remixes and with this whole metal software and separation of the instruments i you know do you think maybe they just wanted their mono you know the mono version that they're used to because that's what it was mixed in up until uh what um i guess you know the white album so i don't know right what do you think well all of the beatles hung around for the mono mixes yep and they left town for the stereo mixes and left it up to you know, which Ken took Scott which took it, which took eight hours to mix or something ridiculous. I mean, for the stereo, yeah, and there wasn't there a lot of disparities in the two yeah. because they, it wasn't that important to them. But uh, you know, Ken Scott's a great guy. If you have ever seen interviews with Ken, you know, he he did Hunky Dory and Ziggy Stardust and yep. and was one of the mixes on the Su White Album. Super Tramp, Super Tramp as well. Yeah, great guy, and he's still good and he's still active. And you know, it's, it's so great to get to meet these people. I met I met, uh, you know, I, I got to go to to uh, hear. The master tape of Sarge, stereo master tape of Sergeant Pepper. They were going to do a 30th anniversary issue of it, and so what they did was they they cut it at Abbey Road, and then it got flown to America to be cut by Greg Calby at Master Disc because Greg cuts a lot of stuff for Paul McCartney, and so the engine. You know, I'm having a, I'm having one of these brain fades right now. You know, very famous. Come on, who who engineered Imperial Bedroom for for Elvis Costello and and engineered Sergeant Pepper? Come on, give me the name. Give me. Wait, I'm having a who? Uh, Jeff Emmerich. Jeff Emmerich, right? So Jeff flew over with the tape to America, and they were looking for the same Studer machine that was mastered that they mastered it on original. And I knew where one was oh, wow. in America, and they brought it over to Master Disc, and and I got to hear it and uh that was fun and then i also brought uh my mofi and i'm not here to dump on mofi i just want to tell you some truths so i brought my mofi of sergeant pepper from the box and i played it for jeff emmerich 
and it got about a minute in and he said take that off it's rubbish that's what he said to me and i said why is it rubbish he goes the eq that is all wrong that is not what we did it's it's like smiley face smiley face it's not what they did and he hated it and then um when he got back to England, I had a question for him. So I called him at home. He was living at home with his mother. <laughs> I said, <laughs> it was, hello, is Jeff there? Jeff, honey, it's for you. And at that point, he was like a 60-year-old guy. Thank God. <laughs> it was so funny. <laughs> anyway, these are all stories from my book or something. You know, something. That's great. Well, let, let's leave it at that. I think this has been a wonderful, I think I really appreciate the time. I'm glad we could uh, get on air here and, and have this almost hour and well, hour and 40 Can I just say one, one, one final thing? Yeah, one, go for it. If you've spent a lot of money on a cartridge and a lot of money on a turntable, or if you've spent a lot of money on one of the top Rigas, you should consider this. And I'm, I get no, no money from, from J.R. Boyclair. I don't get any money from it. But what he's doing is really important. And you buy a new cartridge and you spent four or $5,000 on a cartridge. Um, consider sending it to him, spending the $500 to get the report, to get it back so you can set it up on your immobile arm Riga and get it to sound as great as it could possibly sound. I had a Lyra Etna here that I reviewed, and it sounded good. It didn't connect with me. It was good. I sent it to him. I said, do the report. He did the report, and the Zenith angle was off. And the, even they didn't know when they made it, because it takes a special microscope to see that. He sent it back to me with a, a little gauge and said, set it off four degrees off where it's supposed to be then the Zenith angle will be correct. And I did that. And it was, now it's a fantastic sounding cartridge. Wow. So, yeah. I'm just saying, consider that. Oh, this has been good information today. I want to wish you a sort of a pre happy birthday. Your birthday is coming up and yeah, it'll uh, be March 22nd, yeah, March 22nd. Really and how yeah. can, can we say, tell the folks how old yeah, on March 22nd? I'll be 77 years old. And you know what? It's fine. I don't hide my age. And I can still hear really good. Not, not like I used to hear, but I my listening is better than ever. And okay. I got this kid. We, we compare notes and I'm still good. When I can't hear anymore, and Bernie can hear too. When you, you know, Bernie's. Well, we, we, uh, you, you took offense to that. And that was one thing. And I know you and I went back and forth because on my show, yeah. one of my guests is like, well, Bernie's hearing. Well, he's, yeah, Bernie's 80 years old. So of course his hearing isn't going to be what it was when I, like, I'm 50 no, years old. He's not going to have the hearing I have, right? His listening is still great. And, yeah. you know, when, when I review records that people get back to me and say, uh, you know, I review the pretzel logic and I didn't think it was that. It, yeah. I think that was one of Chad's misfires. Everybody has a misfire every once in a while. And believe me, Chad's the main advertiser on my website. Yeah. And and it created tremendous problems for me. A and I said to, to Chad, I said, I'm sorry, man, but something happened here and it, it's not as good as the other ones. And I said, if I say it's great and people buy it and hear what I heard and then Asia comes out and it comes out great, people are not going to believe me anymore. So I had to say what I said. And Asia came out great, so you know. And Prince Asia, Asia was, came out great. I mean, I I, you know, I made comments yeah. too. All you know, Fremer's obviously shilling for uh, Chad. That's why he said that. I mean, you, I mean, we we talked about this. You and I have had it out already. Yeah, so we're, we're we're past that, and I don't think I meant it like that. Or I think you no, know no. that. I think that yeah. I understand that. I mean, I really again, try hard to be yeah. an honest person in this. And if something's bad, I'll I'll say I think it's bad, and maybe I'm okay. wrong occasionally. But you know. And mm. bad doesn't mean it. It's not doesn't sound good. Like like sometimes like the Marky Moon. It it sounds great. I just sounds great. It. Sounds, yeah, great. sounds great. I like you, I like the wrong like version. It, don't like the original. That's fine too. But for 40, 49 bucks or thirty nine bucks, not a bad deal. Yeah. Okay, we're leaving it. We're leaving at that. We're leaving at that. You're coming back on probably in six months. We'll see where things are. You'll be seventy seven by then, and hopefully. <laughs> um, <laughs> <will be> <laughs> How did that happen? I don't know. But it I just thought it it's like time. that, huh? Yeah. You know, you know, seeing vinyl come back is is like you weren't around for the dark, dark days. Eighty six. I remember. Well, well, I wrote a piece in eighty three when I lived in Los Angeles called "The Coming Digital Disaster," and uh, and I predicted that vinyl will come back and CDs will go away. I predicted it, and that was the craziest thing to predict because CDs were just starting to make get big. It took a long time for that to happen, but I thought it would happen. And um, 
yeah, to see it come back. And Joe, Joe Harley and I talk all the time about, did we ever think it was going to get like this? No, we thought maybe it would come back a little bit so, you know, the geezers could have their vinyl and maybe a couple of crazy young people. But I have friends in their 40s and I go hang out with them at their homes and their living room is a wall of records like my living room was in the 70s. And there's a great turntable and a great amplifier and great speakers. And the TV is in the other room because it doesn't belong in the same room as the stereo. <laughs> we've had we've had that, that debate on our show, too. I, I mean, whatever. Yeah, and I have all these you know, young people. I've got all these young people that are like fans of what I do, which is great. Yeah. And they're even fans of the movie that Animal Olympics, you know, the movie that I didn't. I know, you know that, yeah, that was ni 1980, 1980, I think it was. Yeah. Down there. And I get yeah. emails from people. My, 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 my child, this four year old girl, is a fan of your movie. Can can you sign an autograph? For yeah. Okay. What, you know? One last question. We're going to go. How many records do you have right now? What's your collection approximately? I, I would say about 17,000 at this point, including a lot of old Insane. classical records that I was bequeathed that I have to bring to Goodwill because I'll never play them. And it's more right. like, I know I'll be dead before I play them all, but that's okay because I'm it's expected okay. to have all these records. <laughs> Michael, so, thank you. It's been, it's been yeah. amazing. Um, we'll chat again. Happy okay. pre pre happy birthday. Don't uh, party thank too you. hard. huh? It'll be a good birthday. It will be. Okay, man. <laughs> Thanks. See you. Thanks See a everybody. Lot. Bye. Bye. -bye.